Chapter 2 of Lavenda and Schultz's Anthropology, What Does It Mean to Be Human, looks at why evolutionary theory is important to anthropologists. What I'd like to do here is to provide you with an overview of the development of uh, evolutionary concepts and really where the idea of evolution starts to enter into the picture. And whereas we usually point to people like Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, for their contributions to what we conceive of today as evolution, we can see that the idea of evolution actually goes much uh, further back in history. So I'm going to trace the development or the evolution of evolution, looking at a number of different theorists, uh, from Aristotle to Plato to Linnaeus to Cuvier, Lyle, Lamarck, Darwin and Wallace, uh, Mendel's notions of inheritance, and looking at the evolutionary synthesis, which combines Mendel's work with those of Darwin. The great chain of being is, was developed uh, based on Aristotelian principles elaborated on during the Middle Ages. Essentially what the great chain of being noted was that every organism or every kind of living organisms was linked to every other kind of living organisms. Uh, and so in this great chain of being, those uh, species which were closer uh, on different levels to one another uh, were in fact more similar. Uh, and then the further away you get along with the great chain of being, the more different uh, the different species are. So you can see the place of humans is here between this uh, notion, uh, between this idea of, of flesh, other animals, and spirit, the uh, angels and archangels, uh, and God. Uh, and then of course, in the, um, there's some interesting discussions uh, that tie in with this you know, concerning things like the danger that's present in the forest. Um, here you can see the trees are um, located lowest in the great chain of being and actually penetrating into the earth, which is associated with uh, Lucifer. Um, what the great chain of being showed was essentially this was God's creation without any gaps at all. Plato's notions of uh, essentialism really helped to uh, really frame this notion of duality between the flesh and the spirit, and uh, it really actually led to uh, what later became advances in um, uh, medicine, uh, comparative anatomy, with doing things like um, the disassociation of the spirit with the flesh, or the, the corporal or the physical body versus um, the spiritual body. And uh, Plato, Plato's notions of essentialism are basic, or you can essentially think about this like a photocopier. Um, you've got a, you know, your original document and then every other uh, replication um, after that is an imperfect sort of material realization of this ideal form of this copy or, or whatnot. So what we see in the real world is in fact based, and these differences that we see in the real world are in fact based on the imperfect material manifestations of um, the, that ideal form as laid out uh, by Plato. Um, again, this is the notion of essentialism as a whole. Um, Linnaeus, uh, many of you are likely familiar with Carl Linnaeus's work, uh, in, um, particularly in high school biology classes where um, he derives or he creates a uh, two-name naming system, uh, binomial nomenclature and his natural systems, systems of nature, book in 1735, which again provides a systematic framework, organized framework for the classification of all life forms on earth. Linnaeus believed in the immutability of the species, that is, they could not change over time. Life forms were created by God, uh, and again, they didn't change. They existed uh, in perpetuity as created by God. So um, Linnaeus's notions of, of he's, he's not looking at this idea of evolution at all, even though we still have uh, Linnaeus, the two-name naming system or binomial nomenclature, uh, in scientific studies today. De Millet, uh who lived between 1656 and 1738, wrote Talmud or Discourses between an Indian philosopher and French missionary on the diminution of the sea, the formation of the earth, the origin of men and animals, as well as other topics. This was published in 1748 after his death uh, um, and uh, works between 1722 and 1732. He found that the age of the earth was in fact older than expected. Uh, probably uh, what we have this in reference to are proclamations of the age of the earth. Uh, probably the most famous one from the church is Bishop Usher's work on 4004. Um, what he did in what he based this on was the rate, the steady rate of the diminution of the sea or the rate at which the sea level goes down over time. 
he also looked at the fossil record and said, and said, hey, well, I can't see any of these species here in the fossil record that are actually walking around today. So he's one of the first to point out this idea that some species are going extinct. So there's this notion of change in Dylan Millay's work, which you don't see earlier in Linnaeus's work or um, uh, the great chain of being, right? This, uh, this idea of uh, God's creation existing in perpetuity. Here, uh, we start to see some change happening uh, in terms of the fossil record. Uh, the Buffon um, natural history, uh, general in particular, uh, from 1749 to 1788. Um, he followed the evolution or subscribed to evolutionary theory called degeneration. He had some key observations. Um, he noted there was physical variation between that existed between species and that different animals had underlying structural similarities. Here again, drawing in the work of comparative anatomy. He was also one of the first to make the connections between food supply and population. This is most uh, popularly known today in neo, what are called neo-Malthusian arguments um, that have a lot to do with um, things like running out of resources, environmental resources and whatnot. Uh, and the individual that's probably most closely associated with those uh, ideas is Thomas Malthus. Um, at the end of the 1700s, he wrote his essay on population, um, noting that Whereas the population of human beings was going to grow exponentially, the power of the earth to produce food was going to grow arithmetically, and therefore the population of humans would outstrip the ability of the earth to supply uh, food. Um, also, uh, he was also pointing out this idea of extinction, which was taking place. Cuvier is mentioned in your textbook. He's noted for his work on catastrophism. Uh, noting that new species are uh, being introduced from elsewhere, and you do have species that are going extinct in area. So it's not the uh, birth of a new species so much as uh, this idea of uh, new species being introduced from somewhere else. Um, Charles Lyell is important for um, his work as a geologist, uh, and what this later fed into was this notion of stratigraphic superposition, and we'll talk uh, a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, he uh, developed this idea of uniformitarianism, noting that the current processes that we see today on Earth can be used to reconstruct the past history of the Earth under the assumption that the same gradual processes of, up of uplift and erosion change that change the Earth's surface today um, had also been at work in the past. Lamarck is the first to mention uh, this idea of evolution. Um, and he follows or subscribes to the idea of transformational evolution or this use it or lose it idea, the laws of use and disuse. Interestingly enough, um, Charles Darwin was not the first um, Darwin who was associated with the theory of evolution. Erasmus Darwin, uh, Charles' grandfather, was actually working uh, in a more minor role with Lamarck on developing his notions of transformational evolution. But note here, in transformational evolution, this assumes an essentialist species and a uniform environment. So harking back to uh, Plato's work, uh, and, this, and again, this idea of this essential species that exist, is existing. And that each individual mem uh, member of a species will transform itself during its lifetime in order to meet the challenges of a changed environment through the use of through the laws of use it, uh, use it or lose it, the use and disuse, and the inheritance of acquired characteristics. So this would be things like a giraffe would stretch its neck out over the course of its lifetime, and it would then pass those traits on to the next generation. Now, of course, this is very different than Charles Darwin's work, uh, but when Darwin's work was introduced, there was still some Lamarckians who uh, hung on to this notion uh, of uh, Lamarckian or transformational evolution. Uh, the individual most closely associated with evolution today is Charles Darwin, um, and, uh, for his work on the HMS Beagle as a naturalist, uh, fairly extensive documentation of uh, different uh, forms of uh, life, of, uh, plants and animals, uh, particularly uh, looking at the Galapagos Islands, looking at, of course, the tortoises and finches and other species as well, uh, collecting massive amounts of information. Turns out he was really uh, hard-pressed to publish this information because it directly confronted his religious beliefs. Um, Lyle uh, got in touch with Charles Darwin and informed him that um, Alfred Russell Wallace was intending on publishing, um, and then they end up co-publishing on the origin of species by means of natural selection. Um, essentially, this idea of variational evolution or natural selection 
uh, states that you have, uh, which was developed in 1859, it states that you have variant individuals um, that are more successful or fitter are those that survive and produce more offspring uh, who then inherit uh, the traits that made their parents fit. And so fitness becomes, as a whole, a measure of an organism's ability to compete in the struggle for existence. And again, this goes back to Thomas Malthus's work um, on uh, population as, as a whole and this idea of scarcity of resources and competition as a whole. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the notion of survival of the fittest uh, was not developed by Charles Darwin. It was developed by uh, Herbert Spencer in the, in the sociological context and then has been attributed, uh, misattributed to um, Charles Darwin uh, today. Uh, variation of evolution principles, Darwin and Wallace, you have variation or no two individuals are the same. Uh, heredity, the second uh, characteristic of or principle of variational evolution, that offspring are going to resemble their parents. And then natural selection. Every generation, uh, you have varied individuals which are generated within a species due to genetic mutation. Um, those mutations can either be adaptive, maladaptive, or neutral. Um, those varying individuals which are best suited to the current environment will survive and produce more offspring. So it doesn't matter how fast you can run, how many push-ups you can do. Um, it's all about producing offspring in terms of fitness in the Darwinian or variational evolution perspective. Gregor Mendel's work, uh, he was an Austrian monk that was relatively isolated. Uh, from the scientific community uh, for 30 years. His insights um, do not uh, become incorporated into uh, the scientific body of knowledge to the full extent. Um, previously, there was the notion that heredity was based on this notion of pangenesis, which had developed in, from antiquity, uh, where an organism's physical traits are passed on from one generation to the next in the form of multiple distinct particles given off by all parts of the organism. Now, particles today is what we would refer to as genes. In, in the Mendelian inheritance model, heredity is based on non-blending single particle genetic inheritance where you have dominant genes, recessive genes, and co-dominant genes. The principles of Mendelian inheritance are two, the principle of segregation and the principle of independent assortment. The principle of segregation states that an individual gets one particle, or what we would call today genes, for each trait, uh, in other words, one half of the required pair from each parent, and the principle of independent assortment, where each pair of particles or genes separates independently of every other pair when germ cells, the egg and the sperm, are formed. If you are a graphical person, um, you uh, can see here um, Wallace's notion of uh, this idea of phenotype versus genotype. Phenotype is, is what you actually see, and so that is on the uh, on your left. Uh, the phenotype it would be the types of flowers that you'd actually, the colors of flowers that you'd actually see in these pea plants, uh, red and white flower. In the first generation or the F1 generation, since the dominant gene is present in the Mendelian inheritance, it expresses itself. However, in the second generation, you see a homozygous recessive gene um, here uh, with, uh, from each parent, uh, the uh, recessive trait and uh, the offspring will express phenotypically um, as uh, white um, uh, ratio uh, is roughly um, um, for every three red flowers you would get one white one. Um, and even though you don't see that in the first generation. Um, today, uh, what we call modern evolutionary synthesis is a product of Darwin's notions as well as uh, Mendel's work. Um, these are new neo-Darwinian evolutionary synthesis, which occurred in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the neo-Darwinians study populations. Populations are reproductively isolated species, uh, concentrating on the population's gene pool. Um, and all the genes present in all the organisms of a particular population. They would do things like estimate the frequency or occurrence of different alleles of a particular gene, so things that would um, look at um, differences in eye color, hair color, these sorts of things, and predicting how those gene frequencies might be affected by different selection pressures. It's important to keep in mind that Darwinism today is a method that is modern biologists agree that life on Earth has evolved, but do have differing views about how evolutionary processes work. Many evolutionary thinkers are increasingly convinced that a phenomena is complex as evolution requires uh, what they refer to as theoretical pluralism. So in this lecture, I hope to have given you a brief overview of the evolution of evolution and uh, indeed the uh, 
entering of evolutionary concepts into um, academic and popular discourse from Aristotle um, all the way to today's